Um, so as you know, the Global Health Program, we're now into moving into our 12th year, uh, really amazing program. Uh, we've had an amazing group of uh, uh, fellows and alumni that have gone on to do uh, great things uh, in, their, in their work. Really pleased that we've been able to lead this program over the past decade. We just recently received five years of additional funding um, to extend the program. So we're gonna be around at least uh, until 2027. <clears throat> so the program is funded by the uh, NI National, U.S. National Institutes of Health, Fogarty International Center, and also with support from the University of California Global Health Institute, which is a 10 campus wide entity uh, that supports global health research advocacy and training across the UC system, as well as with our partners in California and around the world. We're now one of seven programs uh, that comprise the Fogarty International Center Launching Future Global Health Leaders in Global Health, uh, or otherwise known as launch training programs. Um, in the first iteration, there were five programs. Uh, the last five years, there were six, and now there are seven. Um, <clears throat> and so far, we've trained, excuse me, <clears throat> Um, we've supported 161 fellows in the first 11 GlowCal cohorts. So we're in our 11th cohort that started in July. <clears throat> These are the, uh, the multiple MPIs and directors of the program. Um, so uh, I'm not sure who else is able to join us this morning, um, but I'll have them say hello if they are able to join. Um, so Natasha Martin is a professor at University of California, San Diego. Uh, Beatriz Martinez Lopez is a professor in the School of Veterinary Science at UC Davis. And Sung Jae Lee is a professor in the, department, in, um, in the School of Medicine at uh, University of California, Los Angeles. And just to be clear, we represent the entire, even though this is four of our 10 campuses, we represent the entire UC system, all 10 campuses, plus our partners. So if you are coming, if you're a graduate student or a professional student or a postdoc affiliated with any of the other six campuses, uh, not represented by the MPIs, you're completely eligible and encouraged to apply. Uh, you will need to have a, a mentor from one of the four primary campuses. And um, uh, Kimberly and I uh, can help you make those connections if needed. <clears throat> we like to have fun. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure uh, who's the fellow in this picture. Probably maybe there's several. Um, so <clears throat> the program has uh, uh, five essential components. Uh, one of them is new. So the main focus of this program is essentially a mentored research project that will take between nine to 12 months and be conducted uh, within the low to middle income country partner institution. Um, and then the other key element, of course, is mentorship. Mentorship is just such a key element of this program, but it's just a key element for any uh, early uh, stage uh, investigator, student, postdoctoral fellow to really advance your career. And we have a fabulous group of mentors. We'll be talk I'll be talking more to you about that element of the program uh, later. Uh, global Health Education, we have a, um, with we have a core set of predominantly uh, online uh, courses that are available to fellows, but fellows are not bound by the list that we have. If you can identify additional courses at other institutions that you think would help you with your career, you're very willing to, we have monies set aside for you to be able to pay for those tuition. Um, uh, and then career development, uh, um, Sung Jae Lee leads a professional development component. We understand that not all of you are going in the same exact direction. Some of you have very different backgrounds. We're meant to be very interdisciplinary. And we bring, every year we bring on usually around nine to 10 different uh, senior um, global health uh, researchers and educators and policymakers to have them tell their story uh, so that hopefully you can find individuals that are inspirational to you as you think through um, the different steps that you would like to take to develop your career. And finally, the newest component, and this started during the la just this past year, the enhanced training um, in the US for our fellows that come from our partner institutions. These are postdoctoral fellows. Um, this is a requirement <clears throat> of the, um, uh, from the from the funder from Fogarty, really 
their recognition was or their observation was that sometimes the fellows that came from our partner institutions did not have the same benefits as the US fellows because they had not had the time to develop that really binding uh, connection with their mentors in the US. So we now require that all fellows low and from the, our partner institution spend two to three months of their time at the University of California campus where their primary mentor resides. If it's more than one campus, and oftentimes uh, or we would expect that uh, you would split your time between those two campuses in some meaningful way. It is a requirement of the application now. So if you're looking at old applications online as for inspiration, do note that it's only this past year that we've made this requirement. So you are gonna to need to work with your mentors, both from your host country, sorry, from your country where you come from and the host institution, as well as your UC mentors to develop a, uh, a plan of how you would spend two to three months of your time, whether it's at the beginning of your training, um, uh, and that has to do with timing and it takes a number of months to get visas and everything in, in place, or the middle of your training year or at the end. And usually at the end would be used to um, develop manuscripts, analyze data and to write next grants. So in, in addition, another new element of our program, and we really thank our partner um, at uh, Universidad Peruana Cayetano Heredia in Peru, <clears throat> uh, and Natasha Martin at UC San Diego, uh, has worked with uh, Willie Lascano, a professor at, uh, at Cayetano, to develop this program. Um, and so we are now offering a Global Health Certificate, um, which has these different components. Uh, it's just about ready to get started. So we'll be learning quite a bit during this next year. And I assume we'll make some additional, some slight modifications. We're waiting for final approval from uh, Cayetano to move forward. But it's going to include the Design and Clinical Research Online course, which is a fabulous course that many of our fellows have taken. Um, this is, uh, again, offered through the University of California, San Francisco. <clears throat> many of our fellows have taken it over, the, over time. We're gonna have eight didactic global health seminars and discussions. Uh, these are being led by faculty from across GLOCAL, including many of our partners around the world. There's been overwhelming enthusiasm from our site PIs from the various institutions from Africa, from Asia, Latin America, who are gonna be leading these sessions. These are gonna be hour and a half sessions and hour and a half followed by hour and a half uh, discussion sections. And then a main, focus again is on the mentoring and mentor relationship for our low and middle income country fellows who are going to be spending time in the U.S. <clears throat> at one of the UC campuses, that these would be the three elements and you'll end up with a global health certificate from uh, Universidad Peruana Cayetano de Heredia. Um, we're also making this available to our um, ad advanced graduate and professional students across the University of California system. And we're thinking about, and most likely we'll make this available to our US postdoctoral fellows as well. So these are the various uh, countries where we work. Um, you've, you've been online, you've seen the various institutions that are connected. Uh, a lot of our uh, sites are focused in Africa. <clears throat> uh, and, and then uh, we have a fewer number of sites in Asia and Latin America. Um, we have some newer sites uh, for this past uh, for this past year, um, and uh, including Iran, um, Ecuador, and uh, Bolivia, and I think one other. No, I think that's it. So, um, and if you have any questions about the sites or the institutions, uh, you can also uh, connect with Kimberly or myself or with one of your mentors. Uh, and learn about that. I just want to clarify one point. So some people say, well, I'm at like, so a lot of my work has been uh, for, since 1994 has been uh, in Kenya. Um, so I use that as my reference point. And let's say you're a, uh, a trainee or um, a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. Our primary partner uh, in Kenya is the Kenya Medical Research Institute. So you say, well, I'm at the University of Nairobi. How could I potentially apply if I'm interested of in applying for the, for the postdoctoral fellowship? Well, what you would need to do, and we've had many people from uh, University of Nairobi be very successful uh, as fellows, um, 
And so what you would do is you would need to identify the site PI in Kenya, who's Professor Elizabeth Bakusi, um, and connect with her and identify a Kemri person to serve as one of your mentors or a co-mentor. But it would be totally appropriate to have another mentor at the University of Nairobi and then to identify a mentor um, at one of the UC campuses aligned with your area of research interest. So that's the way, and that's true for all the, for the variety uh, uh, of uh, countries where we work. Some countries we have multiple uh, partners, Uganda being the one where we have three partners. So if you have any questions around that, please um, connect with your site PIs. Most are very aware of how this has worked in the past and how could the, this could work for you. <clears throat> so eligibility for the program. Um, uh, the program uh, is open to US po postdoctoral fellows. This includes anyone with a terminal doctoral degree, including a medical, a medical degree, a veterinary science degree. Um, we have had people who have finished their, uh, in medicine, for example, who finished their um, residencies and even a fellowship, uh, and then go on to do this as a research fellowship. Uh, we've also had people who are surgery residents. Many surgery residents uh, get usually two years um, during their seven years of training uh, dedicated to research, and they use one of those years for a, a GloCal. So as long as you have your terminal degree, you're eligible to apply. Um, we're also open to postdoctoral fellows from all participating um, uh, countries where we operate. So the 17 countries that I showed you, um, <clears throat> an MBCHB, a medical degree uh, in many parts of Africa is, a, is equivalent to an MD, so you are eligible. I will caution you that it is a very competitive program. Um, and most of those individuals with MBCHBs who've been successful have also had usually a master's, either a clinical master's like an MMED or an MPH or equivalent um, and with research experience to be able to apply. Um, from the uh, UC system across all campuses, we take people with uh, uh, advanced, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, senior professional students, so MD, dental students, veterinary science uh, students, PharmD, et cetera, and all the health disciplines and uh, human and animal. And also those advanced doctoral students, so Mariah Coley will be speaking with you about her experience. So people's work, individuals working on their PhD and DRP, et cetera. Uh, and for the, in that case, you have to come from one of the 10 campuses for the uh, for all the students, but for the U.S. postdoctoral fellow, you can be from anywhere, as long as you're a U.S. citizen or resident, you can be from anywhere, as long as you um, are planning to work with your primary mentor at one of the UC campuses, so you can be recruited from any institution. <clears throat> We pride ourselves in GloCal to being very interdisciplinary. Uh, we've had fellows um, within each of these disciplines and sometimes spanning multiple disciplines. Uh, here's a picture of a fellow uh, in the first year of the program. Um, yes, she's scuba diving. She's looking for um, <clears throat> uh, various uh, uh, bacteria that may produce, uh, she was a, if I remember correctly, she's a, a pharmacist. <clears throat> as a PharmD, I was looking to discover new treatment for cancer and looking within organisms uh, in the ocean, bacteria specifically. Um, we are also open to so all the health sciences, but also non-health sciences, um, including the social sciences, engineering, mathematics, anthropology. If you were interested in uh, architecture and health, anything that links back to human health in some way is considered global health. Uh, and we're open to people from all these various disciplines. <clears throat> so we have different steps um, in that we review your applications once they're submitted. <clears throat> we do expect all the materials to be in by November 1st. Um, and there's good reason for that, <clears throat> excuse me. So first that we have a steering committee. Um, <clears throat> sorry. We have a steering committee comprised of uh, all of the campuses, all the UC campuses, and many of our international partners. Uh, there's a group of around 30 individuals, um, faculty working in global health uh, that help us with this review. Um, they then we, uh, they also, the steering committee also uh, perform for those who are shortlisted, 
an interview, which is a panel interview uh, that comprise of usually three individuals. And then there's ranking recommendations um, that these various scores then help the leadership group um, in order to make funding decisions. And the leadership group is comprised of the four PIs I showed you, as well as our executive committee members. Um, we have uh, Professor Elizabeth Bakusi from Kemri, who represents Africa, Willie Lascano from Cayetano, um, who represents Latin America, and Tony Raj uh, from the St. John's Research Institute, who represents Asia. Uh, helping us to make these decisions. Or really, we're making these decisions together. Uh, we work towards consensus. And in regards to the selection process, we do weigh heavily the written application as well as the interview. Um, we have a set, uh, uh, of set uh, number of questions that we ask you. Uh, we also look for considerations around um, diversity of disciplines and research focus and geographical locations. For example, uh, we you know if uh, we wouldn't want all of our trainees going to one or two sites, uh, we are trying to find some balance of uh, the geographical locations and our partners. And then budget allocation. We'll get into the details of that, but we are given money um, uh, from the the NIH that is focused on HIV research. Uh, and that money has to go to trainees who are proposing to do HIV research. We can't use it for people who are doing uh, non-communicable disease research, for example. We are given money that we can use for to support any kind of research. And then it gets more complex, but we've been very successful in getting funding from other uh, institutes and centers at the NIH to fund eye disease and uh, heart, lung, and heart, lung, and blood diseases, and cancer, and so forth. And I'll be speaking about that a little bit more in a moment. <clears throat> um, so as I mentioned earlier, there's uh, we have an emphasis on identifying individuals who are proposing HIV research. You can look at the Office of AIDS Research, OAR at NIH, to see what the priorities for NIH are. There are priority areas that NIH wants to focus on, including cure research and prevention. It also includes social behavioral research as well um, around HIV. We also are given separate funding from the National Institute of Mental Health, and that specifically goes to fund fellows who are proposing non-HIV mental health related topics. So for example, suicide prevention would fit right in there. Um, we have received funding uh, over the number of years from these various institutes. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about them all, but just I'll, I'll mention a few. So National Cancer Institute, which is the largest institute um, at the NIH, National Eye Institute, National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. So this is where a lot of our NCD research gets funded, National Institutes of Aging. Um, also NIEHS, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. So for those of you who are interested in One Health and Planetary Health, we've had a number of fellows uh, get funding from this institute. So whatever you're, you should, if you're interested, um, this, uh, this slide deck will be available to you uh, in a specific area of research, um, I would encourage you to look at the website um, for these various institutes and look at what their focus areas are in the area of global health. You want to align as much as possible with their priorities um, because it's more likely that, that uh, they will select you then for additional funding, which helps us to have more fellows in the program and helps you because you get a, a year's worth of support through the GLOCAL program. So again, if you have questions, you can reach out to Kimberly and myself. Uh, you can also work with your mentor teams. <clears throat> so here's just a few examples. Some of our fellows, uh, our, our alumni, um, Huang Dong uh, was a medical student at the UCLA Drew um, University program. He studied antibiotic resistance and non-pathogenic bacterial flora in Vietnam. He's currently a pediatric infectious disease fellow at UCLA. Uh, had the chance uh, this past May at UC Global Health Day. He gave a wonderful presentation, part of a panel presentation about the GoCal program. And I believe he published, he, out of his fellowship year, uh, he published around eight papers. <laughs> so quite a high number. Uh, he's a very driven individual and really credits the GoCal year to helping him to uh, launch his research career. 
Uh, Kendra Beard was a doctoral student from UC Davis, um, and she studied the understanding associations between infectious infection, inflammation, iron status in infants in Kenya. Uh, she's currently a senior research fellow at the University of uh, Greenwich uh, in the UK. Lauren Hack was a US postdoc at UCSF. She studied school home programs for youth with attention behavioral concerns in Mexico, in Northern Mexico, and she's now an associate professor of psychiatry um, at UCSF. <laughs> Hendry Sawe uh, was a postdoc from Tanzania from Muhambili University of Health and Allied Sciences. He studied emergency care of acute episodes of illness with chronic disease. Um, he's an associate professor and head of the emergency medicine department, and also notably, maybe more important, no, not as important, but he's also the site PI for GLOCAL uh, for Tanzania. So anyone who uh, is from Tanzania uh, or a U.S. Um, applicant who wants to work in Tanzania um, should be, have already or should contact uh, Henry Sawe. Alyssa, Larissa Otero was an LMIC postdoc from Cayetano in Peru. Uh, she studied preventing uh, tuberculosis in children, and she's an assistant professor at the same university. And she was she received, so for those of you who are aware of the NIH funding for career development awards, K grants, they're all otherwise known. About six or seven years ago, the NIH uh, started awarding these to uh, really uh, outstanding uh, scientists from low and middle income countries. Historically, they'd always gone to U.S. Uh, citizens and residents called the K43 program. And Larissa is the first person to receive a K43 from Latin America. And she's also uh, on our training advisory committee. Chim Tai Mungo uh, was a US postdoc, also funded on a T32 grant, a training grant uh, here at UCSF. For those of you who might be supported on T32s, it's possible to do a combined uh, training program with your fellowship program and, and GLOCAL. Um, and she worked with UCSF and Kemri uh, looking at preventing cervical cancer among women living with HIV in Kenya. Uh, she's now an assistant professor um, uh, in a tenure track position at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, and also has expanded her work uh, to include Kenya and also Malawi. So I mentioned mentorship is really the cornerstone of this program, um, and it's been a tremendous foundation for the for the program. So uh, we've done a lot of uh, work in trying to increase and um, anyone. We have a list of probably about three hundred faculty um, from our partners as well as from across the UC system that have already agreed to serve as mentors. Um, some of them are very active mentors or have been, and some of them maybe have not had the opportunity to mentor a fellow yet. So when you do contact them, you need to give them the context of, uh, you know, Kimberly and I and others breathe, we talk about GLOCAL all the time, others it may be a distant memory. Uh, so do send them the context of what, how you, why you're contacting them. Uh, if you want, you can copy me or copy, uh, copy uh, Kimberly Bale if it's your first attempt to reach someone. So people are very busy. I've also noticed that during the, this period post-COVID or wh whatever we, <laughs> period we are with COVID-19, that people are not as responsive as we once were. Uh, um, and so sometimes it takes a repeated contact for somebody to respond. But do let us know if you're having challenges with this. We do expect our mentors to really devote significant time. And we have a mentor compact that we ask uh, all the mentors to, uh, to sign as well as a uh, trainee. We want a minimum of three mentors. So we want a mentor from your host institution. It could be the institution where you're based at if you're uh, from one of our partner institutions. We want you to have one mentor from your primary UC campus, um, whatever. So if you're from UC Santa Barbara, we want you to have a mentor from UC Santa Barbara. But in addition, you would need a mentor from one of the four primary UC campuses, UCSF, UCLA, UC Davis, uh, UC San Diego. Um, if you are from a low and middle income country um, site, then you could have one UC mentor and you can have two mentors from your host institution, MUHAS is an example. 
So there's different ways of bringing it together. Um, sometimes we, it's best for each individual to bring a different piece of the puzzle that you're trying to put together in your, uh, as far as your research is concerned in your career. Some people will act more as career mentors, others more as disciplinary mentors. Again, you need to think very carefully about who you're selecting and you certainly want people who are gonna devote the time and effort uh, to providing that support to you. Um, in addition, I always, uh, when I talk about mentoring, I say that mentorship is a mentee, should ideally be a mentee driven process, meaning you should be the one reaching out, setting up the meeting, set, and when you have a meeting, setting up the time for the next meeting or call um, as you move forward, and also setting an agenda ahead of time. <clears throat> so I've already talked about this, about the requirements for mentors. Again, one mentor needs to come from one of the uh, primary UC campuses, one mentor from your host site, uh, and then a trans mentor, again, can come from another UC campus, the same UC campus, or another person from your LMIC site, or in some cases comes from an, another institution altogether, perhaps someone you've worked together uh, on your PhD from the University of Amsterdam or you know, wherever who you think uh, would be a good person to be part of your mentorship team. Um, as I mentioned, expectations are high. I think mentorship is really the cornerstone of this, pro of this program to ensure your success uh, and advancement in your career. <clears throat> we expect you to be meeting as a team monthly um, and we have a successful applications. Uh, number one, start early. <laughs> um, hopefully all of you have started the process of writing these applications. Um, it's not that it's too late if you were to make the decision after today's excellent presentation. Anyway, virtual lab, that's fine. Um, but uh, hopefully you've been working on this for a while now. We do have sample applications for you to look at on the website. And here's the website, but um, it's on GlowCal. You can, on our GlowCal website. Um, and do remember um, revision and, and rewriting is really the cornerstone of excellent writing. So we do encourage you to um, work with your mentors to, and have them actually read it, provide comments. Uh, and then for you to make iterative improvements and changes as you move forward. I did mention earlier about thinking about aligning with some of the high priority areas. If you're an ophthalmologist or a medical student who wants to be an ophthalmologist, looking at the National Eye Institute priorities in global health, which should be part of what you do. <laughs> um, if you are focused on cancer, you should be looking at the global health portion of the National Cancer Institute website. If you're a cardiologist, you should be looking at the National Heart and Heart, Lung and Blood Institute Global Health website. If you're focused on HIV research, you should be looking at the priority areas from the Office of AIDS research. This is all part of good uh, grants personship. You want to understand what your sponsor or donor uh, is interested in funding. And this will help us to do the best job possible. We really want to get as many of our outstanding and excellent applicants funded as possible. We're limited to, with some constraints from our core funding. So the more excellent and outstanding applicants we have, the more additional funding we receive, uh, which helps us to fund you. <clears throat> um, the orientation, we have a, an orientation week, uh, which is really my favorite week uh, of the working year for me. Uh, unfortunately, the last three years has been virtual, but we're pretty much assured unless some ugly variant of COVID arises um, to be in person uh, this July. It's going to be the second full week in July. Uh, it's held at the NIH campus in Bethesda, just outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, the fellows from all seven programs are together. We have leaders from across the NIH that come and talk with you, uh, including people like Tony Fauci. Uh, the director of the NIH as well. Uh, we'll see who that will become since uh, there's interim right now. Uh, Roger Glass, director of Fogarty International Center, really makes a point to meet each and every one of the fellows from all seven consortia. 
Um, <clears throat> there's also opportunities to meet each other, peers, uh, other people from other consortia that are gonna be working in Kenya or Peru or Botswana. Um, we also look at having, uh, plan on having regional mentorship development workshops and, uh, and also when we work together with the other uh, six consortia uh, for the Consortium for Universities and Global Health panel that happens every year. <clears throat> this year, it's gonna be in Washington, DC. Um, and we do, we're also looking at having regional workshops as well. Um, we're gonna be having our first face-to-face -face meeting as the PIs, the principal investigators of these programs in La it's been three years or in the middle of October. So I'm really looking forward to working with my colleagues and Fogarty in person to really try to enhance all the programs, not just GlowCal, but through uh, real strong collaboration. <clears throat> so again, uh, connect with us. Um, Kimberly is amazing. Uh, the program would not be where it is without Kimberly. Um, and, uh, and please reach out to us. You can reach out to me directly. Any of the PIs that I mentioned earlier on the website, uh, Natasha, Martin, Beatriz, <clears throat> and, uh, and uh, Jay Lee, you can reach out to at any point in time. And also your, the site PIs, our partners uh, that we're also working very closely with to ensure the success of this program. So I think rather than take questions right now, um, and you can also put questions in the chat. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Mariah. I'm Mariah Coley, mm -hmm. a GlowCal fellow from the 2021-22 um, fellowship year. And uh, yeah, I did the uh, GlowCal fellowship um, to support my uh, PhD dissertation in geography at UC Davis. Um, um, yeah, so I uh, did my, my work in Kenya. Um, and I, once we get the slides, I'll kind of talk a little bit about my background and kind of where I came from when I was um, considering this fellowship and considering, um, you know, kind of fitting this into, I guess, my, my um, career goals and plans and, and how I saw this as being supportive of that. Okay, um, so I'm from Missoula, Montana. Um, so I grew up in a kind of rural farming, ranching community. And um, I think it was maybe kind of that um, background that gave me um, an interest for my whole life in understanding people and communities and their environments. Um, so after I finished my undergrad work um, at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, uh, I took a research assistant position there um, in sustainable food systems, which was kind of my first experience with scientific research um, addressing how um, people both influence the environment through altering it and consuming resources um, and are influenced by it through the food they eat and the quality of their surroundings, their air, their water, and their soils. And I really wanted to keep doing this kind of work. Um, so I joined the Agricultural Sustainability Institute at UC Davis um, in California, where I worked on several projects uh, in agriculture, food systems, climate smart farming um, and other areas while kind of gaining some more experience in research. Um, and I decided to bring those experiences into a master's program um, in international agricultural development at UC Davis. Um, and that for that, I conducted a project in Eastern Uganda on um, participatory engagement of rural communities in small scale irrigation um, development for increasing agricultural productivity and improving nutrition. Um, and it was really during that work that I started um, to understand the key importance of um, human health in influencing how and why people make decisions affecting their landscapes and, and natural resources. And so then as a PhD student in geography, um, I became interested in incorporating this into my research. And the GlowCal Fellowship gave me the opportunity to do that by supporting my project, exploring um, the relations between the soil microbiome, uh, human microbiota, and health among rural households in Kenya. Um, I've got a nice slide kind of showing how I put together my um, project plan, but um, so the project I established during my GlowCal Fellowship is called um, Exploring Associations Between 
soil microbial communities and the child gut microbiome. Um, and I developed the idea for this project, um, drawing on kind of that broad background um, and on my earlier PhD work in the area of soil health um, as a member of uh, Dr. Kate Scow's Soil Microbial Ecology Lab at UC Davis. Um, and the idea for this project started, so I'm on slide three right now. Um, but the idea for this project started as a, a bigger question of um, what is the relationship between soil health and human health. Um, in the soil sciences, soil health is a concept of soil physical, chemical, and biological properties that um, together make the soil suitable for a given purpose, um, which we would call uh, ecosystem service to, to people. And often this is for growing food or other crops, uh, filtering contaminants in the environment, sequestering carbon, um, or providing material for supporting our built environment and, and infrastructure. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and so it's only recently that the scientific literature has started to reflect uh, a growing interest among soil scientists, social scientists, and the public health community in understanding the extent that soils might affect our health and well-being beyond these ecosystem services. <clears throat> Excuse me. As I started looking into prior research in this area, I found a few studies kind of suggesting that microbes in our environments can influence the composition and the functioning of our um, microbial communities in uh, the intestinal tract, um, but these studies were mostly conducted with animal models and there's kind of no demonstration of these relationships specific to both soils in the environment and human microbiomes. <clears throat> but there is a larger evidence base for the linkages between the human gut microbiome and multiple dimensions of health. And so these were the observations um, looking at the literature that kind of led me to um, specifying the research questions that would guide my GLOCAL project, um, which were one, what is the association between soil microbial communities and the gut microbiome? And then two, what is the association between the soil microbiome and the burden of diarrheal disease uh, among children in Kenya? The Western Kenya is a particularly interesting place to conduct this research for a few reasons. Um, so first, there's a high exposure to soil in the home environment um, among young children in, in typical rural households. And second, that this region has a very interesting history of land use change and land conversion um, from primary forests and shrublands to intensifying agriculture during colonial occupation um, to a current regime of, kind of small scale intensified farming and relatively dense human settlements. <clears throat> and third, that there is a high burden of diarrheal disease in this region. Um, so providing kind of both the opportunity to explore the environmental microbial contributions to disease and the potential to generate knowledge that might contribute towards solutions for, for this and other regions. Um, all right. Next slide. So to address my research questions, I set out to collect um, a lot of data <laughs> from each of 141 households across rural areas of Western Kenya. Um, so the data included three soil samples from within the household, um, a stool sample from a young child living in the household, uh, a questionnaire addressing socioeconomic and lifestyle factors in disease burden, um, a diarrheal disease assessment uh, tool, and a drinking water sample to kind of look at the contribution of water contamination to diarrhea. Um, and to do all of this, I needed a lot of help. So with the support of my in-country GLOCAL mentor, uh, who was Dr. Falcona Otano at Kemri, and my transdisciplinary mentor, who was Dr. Craig Cohen, um, I was able to make connections with the um, Kenya Medical Research Institute, uh, Kemri, which was the institution that kind of hosted me and facilitated a lot of the kind of administrative and operational um, details and arrangements that I needed to have to, um, to get this research done. So through them, I was able to hire this um, small team of research assistants, which is in the upper uh, left corner of this slide. <clears throat> 
and established kind of a field data collection campaign that ran from um, July to, or sorry, February to July of this year. Um, and then I also made contacts with a local laboratory in Kisumu, which was where I was based, um, where I could bring samples and extract microbial DNA, um, which I later exported to the US to do kind of final processing and, and DNA sequencing. Um, all right, and there's a few other pictures here. I guess I could I could kind of show you of just some of the field work, um, sampling soils, and a couple of photos from uh, the lab. So, oh, sorry, one slide backwards. There. Okay, so um, so I'm currently now working with the DNA samples in my lab at UC Davis, um, where I'm kind of assessing sample quality and quantifying the DNA uh, prior to sending them to um, another lab for sequencing. So in my case, the GLOCAL fellowship year um, really comprise kind of establishing the research project, um, conducting uh, a lot of field work and a lot of lab work. And ahead of me still is the data processing and analysis and writing up the results. Um, but what I really gained during the fellowship year was kind of this like dedicated time funding and mentor guidance that I needed to kind of independently establish my own research idea and turn it into a reality. Um, so this included not only the, the fun parts of the research process, but I also gained a lot of really, really valuable experience with project planning and operations, um, administrative and, and kind of budget management and um, leadership of a research team. So I don't yet have findings I can report here, but I will be using this work for my um, doctoral dissertation, which I expect to finish in um, 2023. All right, next slide. Um, so there was, a, I was gonna do a little animation on this slide, but there's this kind of thing now in front of it. Um, so I was gonna kind of walk through my process of, of applying um, a little bit here, but I'll, I'll kind of make it quick because it's a little hard to see what this shows. But um, basically starting, I learned about the fellowship in this very presentation when it was offered like two years ago. So um, from there, I realized the time was going to be very tight. So I kind of set out um, a week by week plan for kind of putting together my, my application. Um, so this involved um, kind of immediately kind of reaching out to potential mentors, including my transdisciplinary mentor and my international site mentor, um, kind of putting together my research ideas and plans and um, outlining kind of what my application will look like. Um, and then as C Craig mentioned, kind of seeking feedback as, as much as possible from my colleagues, from my uh, potential mentors and from kind of anyone I could uh, both to kind of refine the research ideas and also to practice kind of telling the, the story of this research and why I think it's important and why I think GloCal should support it. Um, so I, I kind of laid out a little bit like the kind of series of, of drafts I've created and, and things like that. I can share this slide later if anyone wants it, but um, basically I was able to put together the research idea from scratch and um, develop a successful application in about five weeks. So, um, if you're just starting, don't worry. It's, it is, I mean, worry a little bit because it's tight timeline, but it is doable. Um, okay, I think that's where I can stop. Um, I have one more slide with my contact information in case anyone wants to reach out with questions. Thank you. Okay, so this is the time. We um, have a few minutes now for uh, for questions. And if you have a question, you can either put it in the chat um, or you can raise your hand and uh, just ask it uh, turning on your microphone. I do want to mention, I didn't mention earlier, so Mariah has done a lot of work um, as an example. We Part of the program, I didn't mention what you get. So um, we give we pay your stipend. Um, we give you money for travel, uh, we give you money for education, and we also give you $15,000 to cover your direct expenses uh, to carry out your work. And that's for all trainees from the doctoral students all the way through to the postdocs. 
So you can use that for um, hiring individuals, for buying materials, uh, whatever is needed for your project. So I see a question from, from Mariah, from uh, Christina. Hi, Mariah. Um, I'm also a PhD student at UC Davis. I'm just wondering what year in your PhD did you apply um, for the program? Um, yeah, I applied in um, my fourth, I think, no, I applied in my third year and did the fellowship in my fourth year. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So you kind of benefited from having some experience with your um, PI at Davis first and, and then um, extended this later into your dissertation. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so I had finished my um, qualifying exam and my kind of um, prelims and all of that. And um, I had... Uh, originally actually planned to do a different project, um, but then the pandemic kind of derailed that. And so this um, opportunity came through through GoCal, um, which provided kind of a nice uh, platform to kind of do uh, a project that was actually pretty well related to what I had done my qualifying exam work in, um, but was a little bit, a little bit different um, and I think better. So yeah, it kind of gave me the, um, the basis and the resources for doing uh, a lot of the data collection and kind of the field based work and then I my plan and, and I think this is how it is still going to work out um, was to use another year after the fellowship to kind of do uh, data analysis and writing and kind of finish up the, the dissertation. So I'll answer Great, some of the questions in the chat um, from Kayla uh, Kaufman. So there have been there's no limitation if you've received other NIH funding that you're eligible for GLOCAL. In fact, we've had people before that have done a similar program as medical students or as doctoral students, and then apply again as postdocs and get it again. Um, so there's no, and in fact, the NIH even enc encourages individuals who, for example, are on um, NIH training grants called T32s or K32s, they're individual training grants to apply for GLOCAL. We'll work with your program director to see who pays for what during the year that you'd be spending um, in with your in your host country conducting the research. And as far as Topo's question around completion, I think you're hearing from Mariah. She got certain elements uh, completed uh, while she was in Kenya. She actually was just there recently to get some additional work done. Uh, but is now continuing with the lab work and writing and things of this sort. So we don't expect that all of the work will be completed during the one year, but we do want you to put forward a plan that you can complete because we only cover the stipend for that one year. Mariah has support from her doctoral program to support her stipend for this additional year for her to complete her PhD. Uh, what's this three stipends? I'm not sure what Henry, Henry, I'm not sure what your question is. So you get a stipend from, so we pay you a stipend um, and then uh, you get $15,000 for of direct cost to support your research, money for travel. This is all separate line items. Um, okay. I see Innocent has a question. Maybe Innocent, you can, uh, uh, contact Mariah since it's very specific to her question. We've had a number of, I should mention that we have another fellow this year uh, in Zimbabwe who's looking at the microbiome and preterm birth. So we seem to be having an increased number of trainees or fellows that are interested in the microbiome research. Mariah's work is of course extremely innovative. Um, so if you want to reach out to her directly, I know Mariah, maybe you put your email in the, in the chat. I will, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm doing that right now. The stipend, the stipend is uh, an agreement with your, so if you're from the US, uh, we pay you at the NIH uh, levels for pre-docs and post-docs, depending how many years out you are. Um, the, for low and for the postdoctoral fellows from our partner institutions, um, it depends on the rate that your institution pays postdocs. So the rate uh, that postdocs receive uh, varies depending on country. You could check with the site PI what the, what the uh, rate is. We do expect that you're spending almost all of your time as a fellow. So if you're a clinician, we don't anticipate that you're gonna be doing, you, you can do a little bit of clinical work, 
clinical work on the side. We don't expect you to be having private practice and doing major teaching rounds and things of that. We really expect you to be dedicating yourself to this research year. Um, and if you have other jobs, the study coordinator, we expect that you'll give up those that role um, and that you will really concentrate on being a, um, a research fellow for this one year time period. <clears throat> Additional questions? I see kind of logistical questions, but any other questions around the application or? <clears throat> I'll, put, I'll put my email in the chat as well. It's available on the website, but just to make it easier if you have any questions. <clears throat> Oh, I see Blanca has her hand up. Blanca? Yeah. Yes, hello, everyone. Um, and thank you so much for this information. I just uh, wonder if um, on the application, uh, there is a um, requirement to uh, translate our um, um, diplomas or credentials. And is there any institution that um, the local uh, requires to do to do it, you know, like a specific uh, uh, institution to translate the, our credentials or to demonstrate that we have uh, the degrees we state in the application. Kimberly? Uh, yeah, actually, if you're an LMIC candidate, you're not required to submit any um, credentials. You just state what they are and we take your word for it. <laughs> if you're the US current um, doctoral and professional students are, are required. Um, so when you're actually filling out the application, after you select that you're an LMIC fellow, you'll, that question will actually disappear. Um, I know it's on the PDF of the application, so it looks like everyone would be um, answering it maybe, but it's actually just for the current students, the current doctoral and professional students at UC. And part of that is because we wanna, some people apply as postdocs, um, but then they don't finish their dissertation and get their PhDs by the time they start. And that's caused a few issues for us. So it's, we're trying to minimize those sorts of complications for the US uh, fellows. But since um, students are not eligible who come from LMICs, it's not an issue. It's uh, we're only, uh, the only people who are eligible are postdocs. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question, Blanca. Any other questions? while we wrap up. So I think Mariah la laid out a really nice timeline. Um, I forgot that you got everything done in five weeks. <laughs> um, of course, that's when the real work started. The other thing I encourage um, uh, applicants to think about is once you start getting, you know, we'll let you know, uh, usually in early February. Uh, so we have so we have core funding, um, and usually we let those individuals know, usually in early February, but then we get this additional funding from the other institutes and centers at NIH. Mariah, I think you didn't find out for sure until maybe April, is that right? Um, June. Okay. June, okay, even very late. Yeah, it was very late. So, but just to be working with your mentors, if you think, but we let Mariah know there was a good chance she would get funded. We were waiting for things to line up. And so she already had started working on her uh, institutional review board application for Kemri and Davis. So these are things you want to be, we don't want you to get start that process in July when you become a fellow. We really want you to start that process as early as possible. Some institutions it can take up to six months to go through the review process, uh, even longer. And we don't want that holding up the work on the ground. Of course, Mariah had a lot of other work to get started, developing SOPs, building up her team and so forth. So she was busy during those first few months, but didn't start data collection until uh, January. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions right now, I wanna thank you all uh, for joining, I see. And then, um, and then also I want uh, to thank Mariah. And of course, I wanna thank Kimberly uh, and also our side PIs, if there are any on board right now on the call, I don't, I'm not sure. And also our PIs from UC system. Thank you so much. It really takes this entire team to ensure uh, that GlowCal has been as successful as it has been, and we hope for even greater successes. Um, all right. Thank you. Have a good days. Good evenings. Bye bye.